We've been in the book of Galatians for several months, and the book of Galatians is a book about grace, and the whole book is about grace, and it's about the difference between grace and earning your salvation or earning your way to heaven. And so the book begins with grace. After the salutations that we looked at months ago in chapter 1 that are in verses 1 and 2, comes verse 3, may God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And then the last verse in the book ends with grace. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So what is grace? I'm going to give you the simplest definition that I know. Grace, uh, the, the technical theological decision is grace is God's unmerited favor. But to me, grace is God giving me what I want forgiveness and cleansing rather than what I deserve. Punishment for sin. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? And that's basically what this great book is about. And so if you remember over the last several months, we've talked a whole lot about Paul wrote this letter to plead with the believers to reject the false teaching of the Judaizers who had come from Jerusalem to the church in Galatia and were trying to change his teaching from a gospel of grace to a gospel of works. It was Jesus plus the old law. And so therefore you had to observe the Sabbath. You had to observe the various Jewish holidays. And biggest of all that he discusses four different times in the letter, four different times in the letter, is circumcision. And so that's why what he does in the last verses of the book is brilliant. He takes one kind of scar that is the result of a physical surgery, and he's going to compare it with the spiritual scars that he has given his life for in the gospel. So verse 14 begins by saying, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the previous verses that we looked at last week, you remember, the Judaizers were boasting they had convinced some of these believers in Galatia to also be circumcised. We're talking about Gentiles, not Jews, Gentile believers in the church in Galatia to also be physically circumcised. And they were boasting about that. And he said, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because of that cross. And we talked about this verse in depth last week. My interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. The old people of God were the Jews, His chosen people, the promised people. But the new people of God are those who live by this principle. And then he said, from now on, don't let anybody trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. And then that last verse, dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So as Paul finishes the letter, he reminds the readers that he also has physical marks on his body that are a stronger testimony of a commitment to God and truth than circumcision. He mentions these scars. And basically, he was scarred for life. He had scars all over his body. From the many times he had been beaten and stoned 
And all of his stars told a story about his love for Jesus. So, his final appeal is, from this moment on, I don't want any more trouble with these Jewish teachers. I don't want to hear any more from them or about them. They're bragging about their scars or their marks of circumcision, but I have visible marks on my body that settle the argument. I want to focus on these powerful words tonight where Paul wrote, I bear on my body, depending on what translation you read here in the NLT, it says scars. I think in the NIV it says marks. The word is actually the Greek word stigmata, from which we get our word stigma. And so I bear this stigma, these marks, these scars on my body. What can we learn about Paul's scars or marks? Unless you've lived a very sheltered life, you probably have some scars on your body. They may be scars from accidents. They may be scars from surgery. They may be scars from somebody slugged you. And every scar on your body tells a story. And there are two specific different kind of scars that we might have on our body or that might be spiritual scars as well. The first is physical scars. And through the years, I had visited several church members in the hospital who had had surgeries and they had scars. I, I've had some horrifying experiences that way, actually. I wish I could tell you two or three of them. Steve would know them, but, uh, but I just can't tell you. I just can't tell you of people wanting to show me their scars. But, uh, but I'd had several people through the years want to show me, before 2004, want to show me their heart scars. Because when, when you have open heart surgery, they cut you wide open, and you, it, the, you call it the zipper club. They cut your chest wide open, they break your chest bone, and they, and they uh, stop your heart, and then they start the surgery, and the surgery is usually four to six hours. And so I had visited several people that had showed me their long scar from their heart surgery, and then in 2004, I had it. I joined the zipper club. And so I've got this scar here that when I, in, in the morning after I've showered and I'm getting ready, I can see the visible scar from the surgery that I had that made me a part of the zipper club. Now, it doesn't bother me, and here's the reason why it doesn't bother me. It saved my life. It saved my life. Paul says, look, I've got these scars, I've got these marks, this stigma. From the times I've been stoned, beaten, left for dead, but it doesn't bother me. Because it's an evidence that I belong to Jesus. And so my scar, actually this scar bothers me more. I see it's more visible. This one is, and if you've been around me very long, you see it runs from, really from here to here where they took one of the veins, or a couple of the veins that they did in the heart surgery. But it doesn't bother me whenever I look at it. It doesn't bother me at all because I know I'm probably still alive because of that remarkable surgery. That scar tells a story. Every scar tells a story. If you've ever talked to me up close, as most of you have, you may have noticed another, or you may not have, because you got to look and you got to know where you're looking. You may have noticed a little scar that's right here above my lip. And it's been there since I was seven years old. And the reason I have it is, and it's still visible at age 66. And the reason I have it is I was I always spent a couple of weeks, we called it down in the country, with my mother and my father's families down in Cowan and Deckard and Estill Springs, Tennessee in the summer when I was a kid. And I was down there and my grandmother had told me, now do not run in the backyard. Do not run in the backyard. There is a barbed wire fence back there. And that could really hurt you. Do you know what barbed wire is? Yes, ma'am. 
That could really hurt you. So what did I do? Yeah. Went right out there and ran in the backyard, ran into the barbed wire fence and cut my lip wide open. There was blood everywhere. My grandmother nearly died because she thought, I'm going to have to call his mother, her daughter-in-law, and tell her about this. That, that, that would not go well. They took me to the hospital. They took me to the little hospital there in Franklin County, Tennessee, and they put five stitches in this lip right here. And it's still there. The scar is still there. Now, let me tell you, that's different from the other scar. That's different from this scar because this one didn't have to happen. <laughs> this one is the result of making a bad choice. This one is the result of making a bad decision and disobeying. And I have a lifetime scar in a prominent place to prove it. So the Apostle Paul says at the end of this book, he says, I have a lot of scars for Jesus. And he did. We learn in Acts chapter 14 that he was so hated by the Jews in Lystra that he was dragged outside the city and stoned. And stoning was not a mild punishment. It was a Jewish form of execution. When the Jews stoned someone, they were pushed off a ledge higher than the man's height, but close enough that you were right at him. So he couldn't climb out of the ledge. He's kind of in a little pit type thing, but it's close by. And then all the people around would take these rocks that were so big. Now, we're not, I'm not talking about pebbles here. He, they would take these rocks that were so big, they usually had to hold them in, in both hands. And the whole crowd around him would then throw and stone the man until he had fallen on the ground and was usually dead. It was a Jewish form of execution. And they had stoned Paul just outside of Lystra. And they had left him for dead. And they thought he was dead. Whether he was dead or not, I don't know. But he wasn't. God allowed him to live. And the only reason they stopped, Acts 14, 19 says, is because they thought he was dead. Maybe he was dead and God revived him. We don't know. But that stone and those scars tell a story. In Acts chapter 16, a Roman soldier beat Paul and Silas before they were imprisoned in Philippi. And when the Jews whipped somebody, you remember they limited the number of blows to 40 and they stopped counting at 39 just in case they had miscounted. But the Romans didn't have a limit. And so on more than one occasion, Paul knew what it was like to be whipped by the Romans with no limit. His hands drawn up around a whipping post and one or two Roman soldiers would take out a cat of nine tails and would lash him, not 39 times, but until they got tired, until they wouldn't want to do it anymore. And there are accounts of prisoners dying from the Roman beating. And Paul gladly carried these scars with him. He even called them the marks of Christ. The marks of Christ. Wow. Now, like Paul, every scar we have tells a story. And what Paul is saying, and it's why it's a brilliant use of words and terminology here, is, is you, you Judaizers, you false teachers have been trying to impose a scar on these people, a physical scar of circumcision. And by the way, that was only for the males. Whereas Christians may have the marks or the stigmata of Christ. Which is more powerful evidence? I think that's obvious. So there are physical scars. And probably everybody in here has one. And your scar tells a story. But there are also emotional scars. You see, not all the scars on our hearts come from surgeons. Sometimes we bear the invisible scars of a broken heart. There may have been a time in your past when you experienced a great loss. Or maybe you survived a catastrophe. 
Or maybe you were able to escape from a very harmful, dysfunctional relationship, maybe even an abusive relationship. Combat veterans often return with no visible wounds, but they have to struggle with the scars of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and it is very real. If you've never seen it, I have. It's probably worse than a physical scar. Emotional wounds, very real. Every hurtful word someone said to you, every humiliating episode that has happened in your life, every mistake you wish would just go away and you could just forget, tends to stay in your mind. Sometimes it builds guilt within your mind. Sometimes emotional scars can be as bad, if not worse, than physical scars. And if those past experiences and scars are constantly dwelt upon, constantly relived in vivid detail to the point where you actually start feeling the same emotions as before, you may have some serious emotional scars. And you know, there's a way in which heart scars or emotional scars are worse than physical scars. You know what the way is? If you skin your knee or have a scab or possibly a scar appears, that means a wound has been healed. If, if you aren't careful, you can ignore emotional wounds and they can fester and become infected. And then they don't heal because they're not just skin, they're spirit. Spirit is harder to heal than skin and usually takes longer to heal than skin. And forgiveness and grace are the medicines to turn your emotional scars into strength. If you think you may still have some open emotional wounds, you need to see a Christian counselor or you need to have a prayer partner or a prayer warrior or somebody that can help you get rid of those emotional scars. Now, what were the meanings of these marks or these scars for Paul? Well, in the first century, in New Testament days, a mark was a sign of ownership, that you were a slave to somebody. In fact, in Roman times, a slave was often branded with a hot iron, identifying the owner. Paul repeatedly referred to himself, particularly in the book of Romans, as a bond slave of Jesus Christ. So he considered the scars in his body a mark of ownership. They showed that he belonged to Jesus Christ. We know what that means. Even in the 21st century, we know what that means. We know what uh, gangs still brand people today. Gangs brand people with their gang insignia to show that they're to be protected from people from other gangs. We know what it is to brand cattle. For many years, ranchers have branded their cattle with a mark of ownership. So if a steer wanders away to another property, the owner can claim it back by the branding. A funny story about some northerners who bought a ranch in Texas, and they didn't really know much about ranching. They had more money than they had sense. And so friends came to visit them and said, Where's, what's the name of your ranch? And they, he, the owner said, well, I wanted to call it the Bar J, but my wife wanted to call it the Susie Q, and my son wanted to name it the Flying W, and my daughter wanted to name it the Lazy Y. So we wound up calling it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy Y Ranch. And the visitor said, well, where's all your cattle? And he said, so far, none of them have survived the branding. No, I don't suppose they have. Maybe that's why modern ranchers don't use branding much anymore. They use 
computer chips. But branding, however you do it, is still a common practice. Paul said, I have the branding of Christ. I have the stigmata. I have the literal scars in my body that show I am owned by Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. Do people outside of the church know that you belong to Jesus Christ? Your neighbors? Where you work? Your friends? Do they see the marks of Christ? Do they know that though you may not have a physical branding, there is something about you that is marked by Christ? That something about you that helps you know that your body is not your own. Your soul is not your own. Because as Paul told the church at Corinth, don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who lives in you and was given to you by God, you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. You have the mark of Christ, the stigmata of Christ. Do people know that? Do they know who owns you? Do they know who you are a bond slave of? In the ancient times, soldiers sometimes got a tattoo or a brand identifying them with their army. Alexander the Great conquered much of the known world before he died at age 32. And it was said that he wept because there were no more kingdoms to conquer. And his soldiers loved Alexander the Great so much that they had the letter A for Alpha branded on their body to show their love for Alexander the Great. They belonged to him and his conquering armies. And the mark, the branding, was their way of saying, I pledge my loyalty to my general. Did you know God tells us basically to do the same thing? Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, you know who wrote those words? Same guy, Paul that wrote Galatians 6, 17 about the stigmata on his body. And he says, so endure any kind of suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In other words, the closer you get to Jesus, the more likely you're to have some sort of spiritual scar in your life. Uh, a verse right after that, I think it's verse 12, I believe it is, says... All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It, the absence of any kind of persecution in your life may mean nobody can think of anything you're worth persecuting for as it relates to Jesus. You're worth criticizing for as it relates to Jesus. Because if you're a soldier, there'll be battles and there will be battle scars. And the stories about King Arthur and his round table. Arthur and his knights gathered at Camelot and recounted stories from their battles. And in the heat of battle, the bravest warriors stood around their king and protected him because the enemy was hoping to kill him. And the knights who stood closest to the king were the ones who had the most battle scars. And they showed their scars proudly because it was a symbol of their loyalty to the king. And other warriors who didn't have any scars didn't consider themselves fortunate. They were too scared to be scarred. There are a lot of Christians today who are too scared to be scarred for Jesus. And so they just want to blend in with the culture and fit in and make sure nobody criticizes them and nobody hurts them in any way. They don't want to hurt their feelings. They don't want to hurt their bodies. They don't want to hurt anything. And what that really means is you're standing a long way away from the king. If the world agrees with me, 
I'm concerned. I'm concerned. You see, when we stand close to our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, the chances are we will have some kind of battle scar. Closing this book out, Paul said he bore in his body the marks of Jesus. Why did he call them the marks of Jesus rather than the marks of punishment? They were the marks of punishment. He'd been punished. Stone, left for dead. Beaten. They were marks of punishment. They told him, don't preach in, or teach in Jesus' name. He did it anyway. And they beat him. I believe he was implying that the wounds on his body gave him a powerful point of contact with the wounds of Jesus. He knew that Roman soldiers mutilated the back of Jesus. And I just wonder if he was thinking about that every time the cat of nine tails cut into his own flesh because he also wrote these words to the church at Philippi. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. I want to suffer with him. Sharing in his death. Do we want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection? Yes! A thousand times yes! Do we want to suffer with him and know the fellowship of his shared suffering? Mm. Not sure about that. I have one more scar that tells a story, and then I'll be through with my scars. Not through with them, but through with the ones I'm going to tell. On my finger right here, you can still see it, is a scar. I have now had it for 52 years. I was a freshman in high school playing football, and back then times were way different from today. If you were hurt, nobody cared. Actually, my coach, Coach Dozier, said, and you're going to think I'm making this up, so if you want to know that it's true, go watch a video from Madison Church of Christ that they did with Coach Dozier about three months ago. It's on YouTube. You can find it anywhere, a full-hour interview. And the interviewer asked him, was it true that you made a pledge that you were not coming out onto the field an entire season to get an injured player? And he said, yes, that was true. And you just didn't say you were injured. I remember our all-star, you know David, our all-star quarterback got hurt near the sideline one game and rolled off the field so that none of the coaches would have to come on the field and break that pledge. It was a different time. It just was. And so I had hurt my, this finger right here. And it kept, I noticed, and my parents kept noticing too, although thank, thank them for doing nothing about it, it just kept blowing up. And my dad just kept saying, well, let's put a Band-Aid on it, and then let's put a Band-Aid around it. Before long, I had this bandage that was all over the place, and my finger was aching, and it was hurting. It was about to kill me. There's no way I was going to the coaching staff and tell them. So it just kept getting worse and worse. And I didn't, what I didn't realize is that it had gotten infected. And I left it that way for two or three weeks, and I played in two or three games with it like that, and I was a sinner snapping the ball. And then we finally went to the doctor and he said, you have got a bad infection there. And they put me on a couple of different antibiotics and he did all sorts of treatment here to my finger. And he said, you can't play next week. And, and I did <laughs> because I still wasn't going to tell the coach. And it's still there. You can still see that scar. And as I was writing this lesson and I was trying to tell about my scars, I thought then about the scars of Jesus. And I knew how much that hurt me and how much pain it was. And I thought, man, wonder what it'd be like to <laughs> have nails. 
nails driven through your hands, although we think it was most likely up around the wrist. Nails. And the scar that would leave. And I remembered what I said Sunday about there, what is the only man-made thing that will be in heaven. Remember what I said? The scars of Jesus. That's the only man-made thing that will be in heaven. Because every scar tells a story. You've probably heard the old expression, time heals all wounds. I read where some old lady with sore feet said, no, actually it's time wounds all heals. <laughs> That's true for a lot of us who've reached that age. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, I will give you back your health to his people and heal your wounds. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Jesus healed our wounds with his stripes on the cross. I'll close by saying this because this is a story some of you probably will remember. It, it happened, I don't know. You know, time, as you get older, time is different. I'm going to say it happened three or four years ago. It was probably 20 years ago, but... You know, when you live in southwest Florida, and I've been here for 37 years, you have, you know about alligators. And you hear the occasional, because they want to make a big story out of it anytime there's an alligator attack, particularly on a human. And so I think this was three or four years ago, and I, know, I remember it was in northern Florida. It might have been near Jacksonville. There was a, a little boy that a gator came out of a pond and grabbed his leg and was pulling him back down into the pond. His mom jumped up and grabbed him, and so she is holding on for dear life to both of his arms while the gator is pulling at his legs. And she's screaming bloody murder, and the kid is too, and some guy just happened to drive by in a pickup truck who had a gun, and he got out just before the gator was able to pull the kid into the lake where it would have been the point of no return. And he shot the gator three times and the gator released his grip and the boy was able to be pulled out. And so the story was everywhere. It was all over the news and you probably saw it. And, but one of the news reports, they'd gone to the boy's room and like they often do with these kind of things, they'd ask to you know, see his scars and so... He pulled back, and there was, you could see the scars that the gator had left on his legs. And the little boy then said, would you like to see my other scars? And, and they said, what other scars do you have? And he said, the scars on my arms where my mother and her fingernails would not let go and were just holding me so tight, and I was being pulled in both directions. <laughs> what a great story. And what a great way to think about the book of Galatians in these ending verses because we too have a monster who could kill us, whose desire, the thief's desire is to kill and steal and destroy, who wants to pull us down into a different kind of lake. One burning with fire. But we also have a loved one who's pulling from behind. And he's putting on us the marks of Christ, the stigmata of Christ. As he pulls us into life. That's what Galatians 6, 17 is implying. May we all have the mark of Christ that is inspired by the gospel of grace given to us so beautifully in the book of Galatians.